Is the quality of the connection okay from your side? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. And can I just check? I'm going to try and share a screen just to check that it works. Can we do that? Sure. Just yes, do it. Um, let's see. Can you see anything or not yet? No. Um, okay, one moment. I'm going to try a PDF. Great, great. Yes, great. You can see it now. Yeah. Okay, and and it, it's moving okay. Yeah, I I think you yeah. can just keep it that way. No problem. Um, Andrew, let's that way and let's get started. Are we ready, everyone? Yes, we are, Dr. Kazanjo. Okay, then let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our webinar series uh, we call Stronger Together. And I'm very happy to introduce our first uh, speaker of the first lecture of the seminar series. And we will be from Dr. Andrew Liu, a very old friend of ours. We have seen him through the disasters, and this we're going through a disaster area. So, whom could we ask more to uh, give us a talk? And the topic of public health lessons learned from battling COVID-19 one year on. Dr. is in the global public health at the University of Sheffield, and he has worked for many years as a consultant in disease control with Public Health England. Last year, he was a director of primary care with National Health Service in the UK, coordinating the local response to COVID-19. Now, he is involved in the COVID-19 in and Humber region of the UK. Andrew has previously worked for humanitarian aid agency zones and disaster areas such as Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, and the Philippines. And his research and research are in global health, disaster management, applicable disease control, and health management. So welcome, Andrew. The floor is yours, and we're looking forward to hear from you. And to Shakur, uh, Maraba, and thank you so much for the kind invitation. It, it's lovely to be in touch again with Besme Alam Vakif University uh, and all your friends. Um, it's a shame we can't do it in person, um, but I guess this is better than not. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, my view and my a bit about my experience, and it's certainly from a UK perspective. Um, I appreciate it's slightly different in, in Turkey, indeed, in for many parts of the world. Um, so please bear with me. Can you can you believe it? It's um, a year and one day since the WHO declared this a pandemic, a public health emergency of international concern. Wow, who would have thought it? And so much has changed in that time, hasn't it? Um, so initially, we all thought this was a limited um, uh, respiratory viral infection. Um, some of the epidemiologists were much, much more alarmed when it first emerged in China and got notified to the world, to the WHO in January, as a, as a pandemic potential strain. And indeed, this has turned out to be the case. Um, this is a slide from just last week, and it shows the global spread of this um, virus right around the world, uh, affecting virtually every corner. And I guess what's really striking is the level of disease burden, um, particularly in the Americas, um, Europe indeed, we've been badly affected as well. Um, and there've been lots of uh, conversations and, and discussions and debates as to why that's been. And one thing's clear is that the global spread has not been uniform. It has certainly affected those countries that have been better connected by international travel routes um, compared to other ones. And this explains, for example, why the spread of the infection to South America uh, was much more delayed compared to other parts of the world. It is perhaps no surprise then that countries that are well connected, 
such as Italy, the UK, for example, were hit hard. That said, um, the impact of these disease and, and the spread within those countries were very much dependent, not so much on just the importation of disease, but also on how local public health systems, health systems and governments responded. Indeed, how society responded to the pandemic. And at this point, I think it's important to look at what we know about this disease. Firstly, in terms of transmission dynamics, this is a disease that hasn't spread in a linear fashion. On the contrary, if you look at the trends like in the US, in India, the UK, and indeed even in Turkey, when you saw the rise, the rise was exponential. And I think some countries, um, governments such as the UK and the US have been criticized for the slow response to um, the epidemic and the pandemic. And it perhaps reflects political decision making for a disease that spreads with an exponential rate. Um, you have to act fast. You have to act fast. And part of that is driven by this phenomenon called super spreading. Uh, many of us infectious disease uh, specialists and researchers very early on highlighted the potential and the risk for super spreading. And we knew this virus could do super spreading because of its cousins, the other six known human, human coronaviruses. Think of the first SARS in 2003, think of MERS, our experience of MERS in, in the, the past decade, as well as the other human coronaviruses that affect us every winter. The thing about super spreading is that not everyone, not every infected person has the same potential to infect someone else. The figure on the left by Adam et al in Nature Medicine uh, it came out um, early last year, and it showed that 70%, 70% of cases didn't infect anyone. Staggering, isn't it? But you look down the, the table, you will, the, you will, the figure, sorry, you will see that 20% might infect one other person, and then it's a law of diminishing returns. But there are some individuals who would infect six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 20, many more others, okay? So some individuals, for some reason, have the potential to spread diseases to many people. This other picture on the right, uh, and this was in Nature, and again, it's another paper from Science. Now, it's a beautiful picture, and it shows the connections and the networks. First things first, you can see all the individual dots. These are people for whom there is no onward spread that was detected, okay? So a lot of people are individual cases. Um, but more striking are those individuals which have multiple transmission lines uh, onto other people, okay? So not all infections are equal. We reckon between 10 to 15% of infected people account for 80% or more of all infections. Right. And this, this need to act fast, this need to act fast was recognized by the World Health Organization early. And I, I love this um, interview that they had with Dr. Michael Ryan, who was the executive director for the WHO Health Emergencies Program. And he said, be fast and have no regrets. One of the greatest things in emergency response, if you need to be right before you move, you will never win. Perfection is the enemy of the good when it comes to emergency management. Speed comes perfection, and the problem in society we have at the moment is everyone is afraid of making a mistake. Everyone is afraid of the consequence of error, but the greatest error is not to move. The greater error is to be paralyzed by the fear of failure. And he was drawing from his experience in Ebola, uh, uh, which is another disease with um, significant pandemic potential, significant uh, transmission spread, significant super spreading ability. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the parallels there. So we know this disease pass, um, transmits quickly. We know that some people are more uh, likely to spread infection. So the next question from a public health point of view is identifying who's at risk, who's at risk. 
when we talk of Risto, uh, there are two angles to it, two perspectives. The first one is the potential for the person to spread infection. So who's likely to spread loss of infection? And the second angle, the second perspective, is who's likely to suffer the worst consequences. So both perspectives are important, and how we address both perspectives um, matter, okay, from disease control point of view. Firstly, what do we know about those high-risk settings where super spreading is more likely? We know households, household transmissions predominate. So of all the settings that you've got, most spread takes place in households, that's within families. And this is not surprising. You spend the most amount of time with your families in close contact with them the most. So if you get an infection seeded into a family, it will spread rapidly. And the secondary attack rates, the SAR, uh, has been estimated to be anywhere between 6 to 51 percent. Um, that's a paper in Clinical Infectious Diseases by Thomson et al. With a pooled estimate roughly of about 21 percent. In another paper by Lee et al., they, they noted that the household uh, secondary attack rate was of the magnitude 10 times greater than other context settings. Okay, so just to give you a sense of comparison. Yeah? We have the workplace um, secondary attack rate there. The pool estimate, again from Thompson's paper, is of about 1.9%. Okay, so number one, household settings. Number two are workplace settings. Uh, many of you will work in hospitals, and we know from previous SARS and MERS outbreaks, uh, for example, the MERS outbreak that happened in, in South Korea from a returning traveler um, from Saudi Arabia, that healthcare settings are high risk uh, for transmission. And again, this was the case in care homes, the long-term care home facilities. Um, the uh, SARs for hospitals was estimated to range up to 17%, uh, with a pool estimate of 3.6%. Sadly, here in the UK, at, in the initial wave, the first wave of the epidemic, we were trying to create as much intensive care capacity as possible. We were trying to create as much bed capacity as possible in anticipation of a lot of sick people coming in to our hospital units. This led to a policy of a rapid discharge of elderly patients from hospital back to care home settings. And this led to a seeding of infections in those vulnerable care home settings. They, they say, you know, hindsight is 2020, it's perfect. And this is so true in this case. Um, had we known um, the, the enormity and the severity of the risk that we were putting on uh, our care home settings, perhaps a different course of decision might have been taken. I'll come back to that in a bit. All right. The other high risk settings um, that we know about, and this is another paper from Chang et al, who looked at modeling studies of where transmission is likely to take place, um, are in restaurants, cafes, gyms. And this is not a surprise really, is it? Again, you've got settings where people come together, Okay, it tends to be indoors, it tends to be crowded, and you tend to have close contact. The Japanese government very early on um, identified the three C's as being the high risk factors for transmission and super spreading. Okay, close spaces, crowded places, and close contact settings, the three C's. And now the last bit at the bottom I've got down there are super spreading events. And we have seen right across the world many, many different examples, uh, case studies and case reports of um, super spreading taking places at mass gatherings, such as um, uh, ice hockey matches or weddings or religious events, um, concerts and so forth. Yeah, where lots of people are gathered, the risk is increased. The same with parties, people having social events, social gatherings, nightclubs, even something as what, what might seem quite uh, innocent, like uh, singing in a choir. Um, there, there have been certainly reported cases of transmission, both in the US, uh, quite classically, um, the, the case in Oregon, as well as in Spain. So, so that's the first bit, high risk settings, high risk settings for spread. The second perspective, which I mentioned earlier, was 
who is likely to suffer the worst outcomes from infection? In other words, who's most likely to have severe complications and die from it? Many of you will be frontline health professionals, and this past year, you will have seen many patients fall ill and die with this, um, and you will probably see this trend. What I'm going to show you here is a study from the UK based on UK population level data. Um, firstly, we've seen an ethnic trend, which I'll come back to. Okay, so I think minority groups uh, at greater risk. By the way, uh, the, this table I'm showing you uh, refers here specifically to women. Um, the trends for men are fairly similar as well. The second risk factor, um, if, you, if you look in the middle, was whether someone lived in a care home. And if someone lived in a care home, a nursing home, a residential home, the adjusted hazard ratio of them um, dying with this was 3.6. Isn't that really, really high? Yeah. And the next group, and this is, uh, this is a group that unfortunately was missed early on, were people with learning disabilities and specifically those with Down syndrome. So for those members of our society who have got Down syndrome, especially women, the uh, adjusted hazard ratio of them uh, dying from this disease, 32.5, the highest of all the conditions that were studied. And again, further down the list here, this will not be a surprise to you, uh, worse chronic kidney disease, whether someone's on chemotherapy is a, is a risk factor, we know about that. On this next one, whether people have got sickle cell disease or severe immunodeficiency, people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, um, as well as people with cerebral palsy or liver cirrhosis. So if you've got a pre-existing long-term condition, there is a greater risk of you dying from this disease. Here in the UK, we've identified a list of people with these conditions who we, we classify as clinically extremely vulnerable, the CEV groups. And people in this group for the past year have been advised to shield, in other words, to stay home, to stay away from others, uh, and to shield as much as possible um, in order to avoid getting infected because of the risk to them. And they are also one of the risk groups that we have targeted and prioritized for vaccinations in the past few months. Sadly, for many of them, the, the requirement to shield, to isolate, to stay at home, uh, it has been a, a terrible experience, really isolating, and there have been significant mental health consequences for them. Okay. I mentioned to you earlier that we saw a gradient of COVID risk for ethnic minority groups. So there is an inequalities dimension. This disease is not just a medical condition. This disease is a social condition. It's a social condition. So I'm going to show you two graphs. The first one is from my town, Sheffield, um, where Dr. Chris Gibbons, um, one of the health intelligence analysts at the local uh, council, city council, uh, did analysis of the data for the city and worked out this graph, which shows very clearly uh, this gradient across the different socioeconomic groups. So um, decile group number 10 on the far right, those are the wealthiest, and decile group number one at, at the far left, those are the poorest. And you can see this difference, this stark difference. But what's also really interesting, I don't know how many of you spotted it, is decile three. Okay, so that's the third column from the left. Can you see it? The third column from the left. Instead of uh, falling down um, in line with the other deciles, it's actually gone up. Uh, in fact, it's uh, as high, if not higher, than decile one. And you're probably thinking, what's going on here? And what we think has happened here in Sheffield, and indeed many other uh, parts of the north of England, the Midlands in England, where there's lots of deprivation. We think this is a group of people in the community who have poor housing, overcrowded housing. They work in low paid, insecure jobs, insecure jobs. So they've got to go to work. They've got to pay bills. They've got to pay their mortgage. They can't afford not to go to work. And unlike the better off, the, the rich people who can work from home, um, 
workers in decile 3 have got to go to their workplaces to work. So they are experiencing many different uh, risk factors com combined all together from the poor housing and the deprivation to the fact that they've got to work and go out to work and take public transport and work in workplaces where infection control measures might not be so secure. These will be people like bus drivers or factory workers, for example, yeah, or they might be the people who work in care homes, uh, for example, okay. So there is a clear inequality gradient, and I'm sure this is uh, mirrored elsewhere in the world. Indeed, I was listening to a talk uh, just the other day um, with Dr. Stephen Burrell uh, from Canada, and, and he was describing this very similar inequalities gradient that they saw in Toronto, Ontario. And I mentioned to you that there's an ethnic dimension to this. And it's not surprising, really. And this is true for many parts of the world. The, the, the trends here I show are for the UK, but I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Because we know ethnic inequalities are structural. They're inbuilt into society. They were there before COVID struck. And many of our marginalized groups, our ethnic minority groups, they're more likely to um, live in areas that, are, that have greater levels of deprivation. The housing's not so great and so forth. Okay, so these are vulnerable groups. And the other issue about the vulnerable groups is a level of confidence and trust that they might have in authorities. Okay, so here's another um, figure. And again, this is from the UK and it shows vaccine uptake. And you can see that um, if you look in the left hand side in blue, that's the national average. So that's most of the white British population. Vaccine uptakes in the eligible groups are pretty high. You know, if you're above the age of 80 or 70 or 65. But if you're from a black ethnic group or South Asian ethnic group or Chinese ethnic group, your uptake rates are much, much lower. And there are many, many, many different reasons for that. Part of it, has to do with the community, no doubts. Maybe there's a lack of community trust or information or understanding. But part of it is down to us. Part of the problem is us as healthcare providers. Because we often describe our vulnerable, marginalized groups as hard to reach groups. Please don't use that term. Hard to reach group uh, is an excuse. It's an easy excuse for us to, to, to use to say, oh, we can't be bothered to take extra effort to reach out to them. We can't be bothered to do to go that extra mile to deliver services that are tailored for them. We can't be bothered to do more to understand why they might be fearful of, of attending a service or getting a vaccine. Yeah. Um, some others have described it as an easy to ignore group. And we see that. We see that. Better to describe them as underserved groups, underserved groups. And I'm sure um, here in the UK, in the US, Canada, in Turkey, and other places, we will have this phenomenon because that is true for inequalities worldwide. The other key issue that has been much argued and much debated about, both in the UK press, in Australia, in Europe, as well as in the US, was the issue about children. Are children vectors of disease? Are they uh, serious drivers of the pandemic? Initially, you would have thought so. Yeah, initially you would have thought so because look at flu. We know children are, are really potent transmitters of influenza virus. So surely they must be potent transmitters of COVID, or of SARS-CoV-2, sorry. Um, but actually the evidence for this um, has been mixed and it's been, not been borne out. What we do know is that the risk of severe outcomes in children are extremely low, extremely low. Again, I present you here figures from the UK and, and the likelihood of a child uh, age 5 to 14 having uh, dying from this disease is 1 in 3.6 million. Yeah, You are more likely to win the lottery ticket than you are as a child to die from COVID, okay? And many of our pediatricians and pediatric researchers and immunologists are trying to understand what's going on. Why is this the case? 
Um, there have been several hypotheses put forward, such as um, the, the immune systems in children behave very different to adults. The prevalence of ACE receptors are also different in children, uh, in the distribution in the respiratory tract system. Um, so lots of uh, differences here that remain to be seen. I guess from a physiological point of view, um, the, the likelihood to pass infection, just think about it. A child is much smaller than an adult. The lung volumes are smaller. The tidal volumes are different, are much smaller than an adult. So the amount of, of gas exchange and, and what they exhale uh, is a lot less. We also know that the illness duration in children is much shorter. We're looking at three, four days rather than the 14 days or so that we see in adults. So it is likely that infectious period in children is considerably less. But it's not stopped. It's not stopped many policymakers um, putting in very draconian measures on children. And there's this shocking statistic that UNICEF uh, put out, I think it was earlier this month. You know, that schools for more than 168 million children around the world have been completely closed, completely closed for almost a full year, yeah? Many, many more will have lost at least half a year's worth of education. And there's been a study um, from Holland that showed that, that for children who have lost um, three months of education due to lockdown, that three months loss of education is the equivalent of a year's loss of education. And this is at a time when their development is sensitive. Um, so who knows what the long-term uh, social and developmental impacts will be on children of, of all the restrictions we have placed on them. Okay. And this is another graph um, from an article by Mensa et al. Uh, this is uh, from uh, colleagues at Public Health England who are looking at the surveillance data uh, in, in England at, at, at the trends for infections and what we're seeing in the community. So if you look at the red lines, the bottommost pink line, those are uh, preschool age children. So you're looking at age three, four, five, thereabouts. The next line above it, um, in the slightly darker red, those are primary school children. And then the, the, the darkest line in the middle that you see, those are secondary school children. So the, so the older age cohort. Um, the dark blue line, are 18 to 29 year olds, so those are the young adults, and the dotted blue line that you see are adults age 18 to 64. Now, first things first, you can straight away see that there is a delay, a lag in the rise in young children getting infected, okay, which, which is preceded quite considerably by the, the spread of infection in adults. What we are seeing, is the bulk of infections, 85% of infections, take place in adults. Two thirds of infections are in working age adults. And even in the working age adults, a lot of the infections are taking place in young adults, age 18 to 29, okay? So you see this gradient, this clustering of infect. It's not surprising, okay? Because many, of the, the 18 to 29 year old groups, these are the ones going out to work. These are the ones socializing. So it's not a surprise that we're seeing more infections in these groups compared to say the elderly. Yeah. So the current thinking is that schools do not lead to infections in the community in general. In general, it tends to be the other way around. Schools tend to have a trickle down of infection from the community. So the higher the level of infections in the community, the greater at risk you have of infections happening in school and vice versa. And this has been borne out by studies in the UK, uh, including in Scotland, as well as in the US and North Carolina, for example. Okay. The other thing that's really struck me as well, I don't know if you've all noticed this, is in the age of social media, there's been a lot of fake news, hasn't there? Yeah. We've, we're facing a real infodemic here. And you've got the usual groups who are anti-vaccines. Uh, there's an emerging group of people who think COVID is a complete hoax. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to think that. And I suspect for many of them, perhaps they've not had direct experience of life and death with this virus. But there is a group of people who um, believe that the whole COVID pandemic has been invented by academics and scientists and clinicians worldwide. Amazing, huh? 
And to me, this shows several issues. It's an issue of health literacy. Yeah, I'm, I've been struck by how how much our general public lacks the literacy, the health literacy to understand some, some of the scientific context, um, context behind vaccines or the context behind viral spread of infections and so on and so forth. That they are that they are ill-equipped to to question and challenge the fake news. There's also something about epidemiological literacy. I, I find this, I'll show this in, to you in the next graph, yeah? Um, about even among our, our politicians often and policymakers, they don't understand the figures and they misquote and misinterpret um, statistics and epidemiological figures, yeah? And this affects our risk perceptions. If we do not, have a clear and honest and appropriate understanding of the science and of the data, it will affect our perception of risk. It will harm our perception of risk. Okay. So I was telling you about epidemiological literacy. And the classic example is how you compare fatality rates around the world. Many people have tried to do this, haven't they? They've tried to compare infection rates in Afghanistan with Bangladesh, with uh, India, with the UK. But you can't compare uh, infection rates in these different settings because it depends on how good the surveillance systems are. So if the UK or the US is picking up lots and lots and lots of cases, part of the issue is we have better surveillance systems that pick it up. And it's not to say that somewhere else like Burundi or, um, or Afghanistan has fewer cases, chances are, they have not picked up all the cases. Yeah, so surveillance data is hazardous trying to compare between countries because it reflects how good your surveillance system is. But it's the issue of how you compare death rates. When someone tries to compare a death rate, I always ask them, are you trying to compare a hospital fatality rate? So how many people in your hospital have died from COVID? Or are you comparing case fatality rates? How many people with COVID that you have found, your health system has found, that have died from it? But not everybody with the infection has been tested and been found. So what's the true infection fatality rate? What's the true infection fatality rate? Okay. And likewise, in the first waves, first wave of the epidemic, most of the people who died were our elders, the elderly people. A lot of them were sick elderly people in hospitals and care homes. Whereas now the bulk of our infections are in working age adults. So of course we are seeing a reduction in case fatality rates. This doesn't mean that the disease is getting um, less fatal. It doesn't mean that the virus is uh, less severe. It's just an epidemiological phenomenon reflecting who is getting infected in our communities. So currently, um, infection fatality rates, again, this depends where you are in the world, is anywhere between 0.27% to about 0.68%, thereabouts. Whichever figure you use here, these are still considerably worse than flu. So please, COVID is not flu. COVID is not flu. I don't know about Turkey, but suddenly here in the UK and the US, there's been a lot of science wars, debates between the scientists, and there's been a lack of consensus on various issues. For example, very early on, and it's still going on now, is this disease predominantly spread by droplets? or airborne. And depending on whether you think it's droplets or airborne, that, that affects what kind of infection control measures you use. It will guide what type of face mask you're going to use in the hospital, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, me personally, I think this is a, it's a false dichotomy. It's a spectrum of droplets to airborne. All of it probably happens. Um, the fact that you can get airborne spread with uh, SARS-CoV-2 suggests we ought to be far more vigilant in our measures against it. Yeah, and certainly, should face masks be worn? Well, take a look. The Chinese have been using it for the last uh, 15, 16 years, haven't they? Yeah, so perhaps it's something we, we need to learn as well. So face masks. I mentioned the issue about school safety. Um, the other big question is, should we as a country or as a world go for zero COVID? And there's been lots of uh, arguments about what do you mean by zero COVID? Are we talking about elimination? Are we talking about control? Or are we talking about eradication of SARS-CoV-2 uh, globally? And whether that's achievable, whether that's achievable in the, at the current time remains to be seen. Yeah? Um, 
Unfortunately, I suspect in many parts of the world, this virus is now endemic. This virus is now endemic. So it's going to take a lot of effort if you're going to try and eliminate or eradicate it. And there will be a cost to it. There will be a cost, a societal cost, if you're trying to eliminate or eradicate it. Okay. And the last thing that's very common in the UK at the moment is the use of mass testing. Um, so this is the use of uh, those rapid um, lateral flow devices, antigen tests uh, for COVID. Um, some people say, yeah, it's good, we do it. It means you find some infections that you can then terminate the transmission chains. Others are concerned about the risk of false positives and um, the false reassurance you might get from a, a false negative result. So lots of arguments still about whether mass testing uh, is worth it, whether it's effective. Me personally, I think the evidence is not there for it just yet, but the absence of evidence isn't the evidence for absence. Yeah, so it remains to be seen. In the last few minutes, I'm going to challenge some of our thinking, really. Um, many of us have started this pandemic with very strong views that might be unconscious. Yeah, even me. You know, I go back a year ago and I was still telling my students that mm, there isn't any evidence for face masks, but I've changed my tune now. And I think the evidence base is much stronger for it. We have to be careful about the assumptions we make. Okay, we have to keep an open mind. This is still a very new virus and there are lots of changes. And I've put here two optical illusions. Yeah, um, you, many of you have seen this before. So the picture on the left, is it a picture of a young woman or is it a picture of an old woman? Which, which did your mind's eye see first? Yeah, and every time you look at it, yeah, do you find your brain seeing one image before the other? Okay, and the same, the one on the right, is it a duck you see or is it a rabbit? Okay, and, and just how difficult is it to change our thinking to be able to see both images as 50 50? Yeah, to be able to see both images. Uh, you tend to find that um, the way we think in, in, in terms of psychology, we, we, we tend to uh, go down tried and tested paths. We tend to see things in one way. And the reason why this is dangerous in dealing with an emergency like a pandemic is it leads to what we call single mode thinking. You can only see one explanation or one way of things working. And this limits our ability to understand the risks, to, to find solutions and so forth okay so be careful about single mode thinking public health has always been political it's political in every country because the measures required are population level measures they are not individual level measures they are population level measures yeah and because it's political you will find a lot of political interference from ministers from politicians from lobby groups advocacy groups, the charities, the third sectors, community groups, religious leaders, you name it, you'll get lots of it. Yeah. And there will always be this argument about do we go for a centralization of response and control or do we go for localism? And it also then hinges on public trust. So in Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, there was a lot of trust in the government's measures. So adherence to a lot of the control measures was very good. In the UK, that's less so. In the UK, it's been stated that people with infections, you know, uh, only about 20% comply with uh, isolation. Can you believe that? 20% of cases complying with isolation. Yeah. Um, last couple of slides. So we've seen a massive decline. This this is it's a false argument people have made that you know health is separate to economy and trade. You know, our economic health as a country is so linked to our um, uh, population health. Yeah, so we need we need very much to um, address both. You can't have one without the other. There's still many unknowns, which I've mentioned earlier. What's the right vaccination strategy? Around the world, we are currently targeting people at highest risk of death. But look at Indonesia. In Indonesia, they got they went for a different approach. They went to target young people first they thought let's vaccinate the people most likely to spread infections and i'm really interested to see how that experiment works it's a natural experiment to see which one works best yeah okay and how do we prepare for the next pandemic 
and this is a long talk which we'll have to come back for another time i guess is how do we prepare better it's not just about hospital preparedness it's about investments in public health about addressing inequalities about better infection prevention and control it's about better disease surveillance and better global coordination and solidarity yeah the, the last bit there's no point us vaccinating all of the uk all of the us all of turkey all of israel if there are still pockets of infection elsewhere in the world we live in a globalized world infections will come back in and if you have lots of infections somewhere else that increases the likelihood of the emergence of variants of mutations that might lead to vaccine escape. So we are not all safe until we are all safe. Okay, I, I think I've rabbited on long enough. And what I'd like to do now perhaps is, is be a bit more interactive and let's do some questions and answers really. So uh, back to you, Professor. All right, thank you, Andrew. This was a great talk and I have already my questions. So the others, uh, push their questions, so I'll be the first one to ask you. Uh, while you're talking about uh, the spread spreaders of the disease, I just wondered what it was the maximum number of a spreader in the UK that you know of. Oh gosh! I um, mean, you know, you talked about twenty or nine or ten, and do you have any idea what is the maximum number? Oh, gosh. I've certainly seen numbers, uh, conservative numbers, about 20-ish. Um, I saw one report of 100, but I'm a little bit skeptical about whether it's truly one person giving to 100. But, but in these super spreading events, sometimes you get a chain of infections, one super spreader to another super spreader to another super spreader. Um, and the classic one was in Singapore with the first SARS, where five people led to 250 infections. So. Okay, great. And, and you named it as a social disaster, which I also totally agree, because this is not only related to healthcare, but also, as you showed in your slides, it's an, it has an economical point of view, international relations, and um, everything, actually, uh, policies, policymakers, and things like that. But what do you think about how we improved throughout this last year in terms of research collaboration worldwide, in terms of coming up for protocols for the treatment of the disease mm. or vaccines or treatments available. And especially I would wonder about your comment with the, you know, publication of these not really, a, what would I say, reviewed papers. <laughs> a couple of words about that also. That's what, critical because uh, while you were talking about, you know, when we are advocating for the treatment or vaccination programs, we all go back to what is available as terms of data. And we were also a little bit bewildered uh, about this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, great question. So firstly, you're right. The, the research collaboration and the clinical collaboration worldwide has been phenomenal, hasn't there? Um, there have been so many social media groups set up, network groups set up between clinicians and, and subspecialty groups, whether it's neurology or pediatrics set up, where people were sharing um, the understanding of the disease and how, how to manage it and all that, which is great. And the research collaborations, such as the recovery trial, um, looking at plasma therapy or whether hydrochloroquine uh, works and all that. Fantastic, phenomenal, yeah. So in terms of research collaboration, that's been a real bonus. Um, and in a way, it's supercharged things. I look at the research funders here in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in many other countries. They've been much, much quicker uh, to approve uh, research bids. Um, and thankfully, they focused it on the problem at hand, which is uh, as COVID, and have invested so much in in that that, in that element, basically. Yeah. So from from that sense, yes, it, it's been a real positive there. Uh, with regards to preprints, uh, so that is the what you're describing here, the the sharing of of information or of articles before they've been peer reviewed. I've got mixed feelings about it. Because uh, on one hand, it's good. The, the, the papers are out a lot quicker, so people read them. Uh, the, the trouble is a lot of it hasn't been reviewed, as you say. Uh, so who's to know the quality of what's going out? And these 
uh, preprints, especially if it's on a very exciting topic that the media is interested in, it gets picked up and it's in the newspapers and it is in the television and it's very hard to, to retract and, and pull it back. Um, as, a, as a journal editor, so, so I'm, the, I'm the editor for public health, as you know, um, we have seen the number of, of uh, submissions to us triple. Yeah? It's gone up 300% in the last year, a phenomenal amount of work being, being written and submitted. But not all, not all of it is good. So we're seeing quite a mix um, as well. So I guess we have to be careful on both both sides. Okay, great. Uh, another thing that was interesting um, to our viewers was um, the risk of mortality or morbidity uh, in COVID-19 in those patients with disabilities. I think this is a, a topic area for myself and a new area or uh, point of view, actually. So. How was that defined? I know that the NHS has actually been very active in terms of collecting the data, real patient data. And yep. that because of the kidney data that has been uh, you know, shared with us recently. And, and actually you have these, uh, what would I say? Treatment arms that you recruit people to, uh, you know, as soon as they come into the hospital and they've been recruited to different treatment modalities. So. Um, what is the population with disabilities and the number of those people actually? That will be fine because we, you know, the figure that you have shown was related to only females. So what about men? Yeah, okay. So yes, if you go back to that paper, um, the trends were fairly similar with men. Um, we're lucky in the UK, exactly as you've described, that uh, we have set up this research infrastructure uh, where we're able to capture a lot of patient data. That's all, we've also made a lot of our data available. Um, you, you'll probably be familiar with the UK Biobank, yeah? Um, which, and I think there was a paper just released last week, um, and they were looking at all the various um, parameters, you know, pathology lab results and all that, and trying to correlate it with illnesses and stuff. Um, and that's open, ac uh, open access to the world. Um, I think, yes, you can learn some things from the UK trends, but it's also important to bear in mind that the UK population is not representative of Turkey or of Malaysia or Japan. Um, and we can use it as a guide, uh, I guess. Um, and to be fair, some things I suspect will be common across countries. I'm, I'm sure diabetes and chronic kidney disease will, will be lethal conditions wherever you are in the world. So. It becomes a question of magnitude. Just how bad would it be where you are? Uh, my apologies, Professor. I think you're on mute. Okay, now, just a minute. Uh, okay, I think that we need to once more emphasize that we're not actually protected in our houses or households. We think that we're better when we're at home but if someone is carrying the virus, that's probably one of the risky areas. So it would be a good reminder to go over that again. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, and I think the one element that we have been focusing in more in the last few months is the, the issue of ventilation. Um, in, in the early months, we didn't talk too much about ventilation because we all thought it was droplet spread and fomite spread. I doubt it's for might spread that much. I think it's much more airborne. So ventilation is important. Um, we're advising in classrooms, keep your windows open at least 10 minutes every hour. Um, perhaps you're luckier in Turkey. Here in the UK, we have rubbish weather, so it gets cold. Um, but um, if you're able to ventilate your, your buildings, your wards, your homes, your shops, your restaurants, and your workplaces, that will make a big difference. Well, there's a, a great question from our microbiologist, Professor Doimas. Uh, he's asking, you, he thanks you uh, anyway, but do you expect this pandemic to be similar to other seasonal coronaviruses in a couple of years? And you were actually commenting that this is already an endemic disease. So what is your opinion? Okay. I, I would say uh, Professor is probably more of an expert in that element than me. <laughs> but um, 
from what I've read and uh, and what I've seen on on some of the webinars with the other microbiologists is that um, this transition to the coronavirus becoming endemic and becoming seasonal uh, takes years, maybe even a decade to get there. So we've got to be careful in assuming we're going to be there tomorrow or even later this year. Um, even here in the UK now, we are cautious. We think there's a potential risk for a further epidemic wave later this year in the winter. Because let's face it, no vaccine is perfect. Even if you have 100% coverage, you still have vaccine failure. Um, and you still have people with waning immunity. We don't know how long the immunity from vaccines or infection lasts. Um, so there is a potential for another um, uh, emergence of another epidemic wave. And the virus is still evolving because vaccines put a selection pressure, don't they, on viruses. And the viruses will continue to mutate. It doesn't seem to be mutating as fast as the influenza virus is, thankfully, uh, but it, it, is, it still has the ability to mutate and develop some vaccine escape or immune escape. And that's why we in the UK are really worried about the emergence of variants, the new variants of concern. Um, so you'll probably be familiar of the P1 and P2 variants from Brazil uh, or the South African variant. Um, I know most of the world are worried about the uh, UK variant. <laughs> Um, and, and there's also the emergence of uh, variants with E484K mutations. So, yeah, let's see. Let's see. Well, uh, we have the UK variant in 76 of our cities and countries like 81 cities. So for five more cities to get acquainted with the UK variant. Anyway, but what is the hope of, you know, we had this hope that as people outside infectious diseases or microbiology, that the virus will uh, mutate so that it will fade away, actually. It will not be finding the humans as hosts. So is there any chance or is it, you know, mutating in the other way uh, to find new, you know, hosts? Well, in, in, in terms of evolutionary biology, you're, you're right, Professor. It would, it, it, if you follow the trends of the other coronaviruses, it should mutate to become milder, it should. Um, but then who's to say it can't mutate the other way and get more severe, <laughs> you know? And I think the other thing that's really interesting when, when you look at the seven known uh, uh, human coronaviruses is that they've all originated from a animal reservoir, yeah? Uh, mostly bats, but also cattle. Um, and there's a need for us to have almost this biosecurity animal surveillance. So the WHO team that went to investigate in China last month, the salt. Um, and they said it's not from the seafood market uh, in Hubei, okay? Where's it come from? And they were thinking, could it have come from some of the neighboring Southeast Asian countries where there is no or not enough animal surveillance, yeah? Uh, many of the, the human coronaviruses were only that, um, found in 2004 because we were looking for them. So who knows how many more viruses are out there in zoonotic reservoirs that we don't know about. True. Another question. Um, they thank you for your talk. And this is also a critical issue that we discuss in the social media or news everywhere. Do vaccinated people still get infected and do they spread the virus? Probably the critical issue is do they spread the virus? Yeah. yeah that full vaccination and what the antibodies probably. I don't know. Yeah, that's a million dollar question. Um, so, so the Public Health England scientists are being cautious at the moment. Uh, although I've seen other scientists uh, around the world uh, saying there is emerging, emerging data, um, for example, from the Pfizer trials and from Israel, that it does appear to reduce transmission. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah. So we know it reduces the likelihood of you dying or, or being hospitalized in hospital with an infection because those were the outcomes measured in the trials, the vaccine trials. But emerging evidence suggests that it does reduce transmission. Um, so I'm hopeful on that count. I'm hopeful on that count. Um, the, the, the figures are quite wild. Um, one estimate was 50% reduction, another one was 95% reduction. So take your pick, somewhere in there. All right, thank you. I guess, Andrew, we will say thank you to you uh, 
Um, it has been a lively, lovely uh, lecture, and this topic will not end for a while, it seems. Uh, we hope that we can be discussing, you know, the real outcomes of this uh, pandemic soon, but I don't think so. It's going to be so soon as you commented. So it's, it was very nice to have you with us again. And we're looking forward to hosting Bez Malam in Istanbul soon. <laughs> As, I hope so too. You know, we have our vaccine report card so that we can travel, uh, I guess. <laughs> and we'll see how we move forward. And thank you once more. And I thank the, uh, our uh, viewers who, in, who were following us uh, from the YouTube and uh, the Zoom meeting. Thanks again and see you at another meeting. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.